It's a great pleasure for the UniWider staff, myself included, to wish you all a warm welcome uh, to this July 2017 Wider Development Conference entitled Public Economics for Development. Time to uh, turn to the opening keynote uh, by Professor McKean, who, as I've already indicated, will share with us his thinking on tax administration. Professor Keane is Deputy Director of the IMF's Fiscal Affairs Department, and before joining the IMF, he was Professor of Economics at the University of Essex and Visiting Professor at the Kyoto University. He was awarded the Mosgrave Prize in 2010 and is an honorary president of the International Institute of Public Finance. Professor Keane has led technical assistance missions to well over 30 countries and is co-author of books on the modern VAT, the taxation of petroleum and minerals, and changing customs. Mig is a true expert and, in addition, a great colleague. It is a privilege and an honor to invite Professor Keane to take the floor. Please, thank you. Thank you very much, Finth, and um, <clears throat> it's a very great uh, pleasure and honor to be here with you. So what, the context then of, of what I'm going to be talking about is this wider uh, rejuvenation of public economics for development. Actually, it occurs to me as I, was, as I was listening that, in fact, a lot of my presentation doesn't particularly distinguish between developing countries and others, because I think at the, at the level a lot of the methodological points I'm going to make uh, are they're really equally applicable to, to all countries. Clearly, they, the application would vary, but I think there's a lot of commonality in the themes and, uh, and methodological issues that I'm going to be touching on. So, of course, we know that uh, we have some key characteristics of the work, uh, the, the kind of revival, rejuvenation of work on public economics in the development context. We have, as Finn mentions, this uh, <clears throat> renewed empirical focus with careful attention, usually to issues of endogeneity, <clears throat> maybe not quite so, as much modesty on external validity as one might like, nonetheless, clear methodological improvements, uh, use of new data sets, including, but of course not only large administrative data sets, and at the end I'm going to mention a couple of new uh, uh, data sets that, uh, that I think may be of interest to researchers. And of course there's, more, uh, there's uh, an increased focus on issues of practicality, issues of administration. And I suspect, where Finn was thinking about, was wondering about research topics, I think this is going to become an increasingly important area, really because of technological change. Technological change, it's not my topic today, but it's going to change not only how we do what we now do, but the things we can do. The things we can do can potentially be extre extremely different in terms of policy design from, from what they are now. We've really hardly begun to think about that. I'd say in terms of tax policy, we haven't really thought about that at all. We focused on some very narrow issues. We haven't embraced some of the wider issues. Now, I'll, I'll say a little bit about one aspect of, uh, of technological change, digitalization, uh, <clears throat> as I go through, uh, through the talk. So there's clearly, again, as Finn says, a large and still uh, very rich agenda. In fact, uh, I think there's still a lot more to do in terms of, I would say, better integrating theory, uh, evidence, and practicality, certainly on the tax side. And perhaps you may detect a little bit of an undertone in my remarks that actually this, uh, the rejuvenation hasn't really delivered as much yet uh, as one might hope, and that there's, there's scope to do, I think, a lot better job in terms of this integration. But let me then, that's the wider context, and let me then say a little bit about, uh, offer you some thoughts on tax administration issues in that, uh, in that setting. So I'm going to start by reflecting a little bit on the state of research on tax administration brackets and policy, focus a little bit on what I'm going to call tax gaps and how one might think about integrating those rather better in thinking about tax policy and tax uh, systems. This is really an example of how one can, I think, actually, economists can actually help uh, to bring insight into things that administra administrators worry about. Then I want to say a little bit about the um, uh, rather interesting idea of optimal tax administration and then offer some, some final remarks, including, uh, if I have time, a little bit on a couple of these data things. So what about research on tax administration? Clearly, there's been a, a, a bit of an explosion recently. Before that, <coughs> the literature on tax administration was basically boring. Um, and basically what the, uh, I hope people here in the audience weren't actually engaged in the research at that time, but it was not, uh, it was not the, um, the most exciting field. 
uh, which it probably now certainly is amongst them. So there was a lot of work, for example, on measuring administration costs. Administration costs, I mean the costs that the tax administration incurs in implementing the tax system, and measuring to compliance costs. That is, the costs that taxpayers uh, incurred in complying with their obligations, or perhaps evading their obligations, or planning around their obligations. Uh, so a lot of work on measuring these two things. Not really much, in, not much uh, interest in, well, why should we care about these things? So what? Uh, there was no real answer to the question, the so what question, but a lot of work done on this. Not as straightforward as it might sound. It's actually technically quite difficult, uh, conceptually and technically quite difficult, but nonetheless, it wasn't really clear why, uh, we're, why we were doing it. And on the theory side, there was a lot of work built around, some of you may know, the Allingham Sanmo model, but a kind of a standard model of tax evasion, which really didn't explain a lot of things we actually observed. So there was a lot of kind of theoretical uh, agonizing over how to make models look a bit more, more like uh, what we observed by going through you know, non-expected utility, all this kind of stuff, to try and make the models m match some basic stylized facts rather better. So that was what the research was doing. It wasn't, frankly, terribly exciting. It wasn't the kind of area you would necessarily push uh, uh, bright uh, graduate students to get into. Notably, there was really no established framework by which you could say, well, what is the optimal level? What is the appropriate level of this administrative intervention? How do we assess, for example, um, the creation of a large taxpayer unit, uh, uh, introduction of a new third party withholding, uh, nudges of various kinds? What is the actual framework within, we, with, within which we can evaluate these? Moreover, how does that framework relate to our framework for policy? Because on the policy side, as I'll say in more detail, we do have, we've had for many years, a very well established framework for thinking about tax policy interventions. We really didn't have anything like that uh, <coughs> on the administrative side. By now, you'll have guessed that I'm going to be giving you a, such a framework later on. But nonetheless, the, this is the state of, state of play until recently. So the, recently, then, we've had this explosion of empirical work. And there are many very technically excellent papers out there that use experiments, natural or otherwise, to address various issues of tax compliance. That is, the extent to which the way in which uh, taxpayers uh, meet or not their obligations. Just to give some of the my kind of uh, uh, somewhat random, but these are amongst my favorite examples. There's, a, there's a really good paper by Pomerantz, uh, which looks at compliance in VAT chains. And this is a, this is a very in, in, ingenious study. It's a kind of standard thing in that what she did was she sent letters to various uh, um, uh, VAT registered firms in Chile, telling them that the ch basically saying your chance of audit has gone up fairly standard thing, but the interesting twist was she looked not at what happened to their compliance, but what happened to the compliance of the people they bought from and the people they sold to. Because that's casting light on how this VAT chain, how the chain of VAT obligations works out. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Another nice study looked at the effect of lotteries in uh, uh, Sao Paulo, in Brazil. So lotteries, are these are these arrangements you may be familiar with where uh, essentially, retailers are encouraged to give you an invoice. VAT uh, retailers are encouraged to give you an invoice, exposing themselves to uh, more uh, mo uh, closer monitoring. And the, the <coughs> incentive for them to do that comes from you because the invoice becomes basically a lottery ticket. Uh, so clients have an incentive to request an invoice because it gives them a lottery ticket. So it's a very careful experiment, kind of a natural experiment to try and look at the impact of lotteries on tax compliance. And then, of course, there's a whole set of papers that look at nudges to taxpayers of various kinds. These are these kind of letters saying, well, you know, your neighbors have paid their tax, why don't you? Or this is what your tax revenue is used for, and looking at the impact uh, of, on, on compliance of these kind of uh, nudges. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, very careful, high-quality work going on. But of course, the question is, well, what have tax administrators actually learned about this? So, where I work at the fund, I have about 40 colleagues who are tax administration people. This is what they do, that's what their careers have been, has been advising countries on tax administration. What do they actually learn from all this? Well, I think the Pomeranz study does teach something, because one of the things that comes out of the uh, Pomeranz study, which was the VAT chain one that I mentioned a moment ago, because there's always this question that, for those of you who know how the VAT works, you know, I charge you, you take a credit, but you charge your customers, so on and so on. There's always this issue of, well, if you want to improve compliance in, in a VAT, do you put your uh, enforcement measures at the start of the chain, say on imports and big businesses, 
or do you put it at the end on the smaller retailers? So do you want do you want the compliance to kind of ripple forward, or do you want it to ripple back? And one of the implications that comes out of her work is a very count, to me at least counterintuitive one, which says actually start at the end. You start with the retailers and try to work back in terms of compliance, rather than focusing on importers and and big businesses at the beginning of the chain. Um, I'm not sure I quite believe the result, but you can see that's a really useful result uh, for tax administrators. That's actually very the kind of thing that really can help uh, <coughs> form uh, administrative interventions. A number of other studies, I haven't mentioned them, uh, have done things like document the importance of withholding schemes. The idea that you know it's important to um, get hold of the money, for the tax authorities to get hold of the money before people can spend it. And there are very uh, eminent papers on this. This, is a, this, I would see, is rather different. If I go to my tax administration colleagues and say, do you know that tax withholding and also third-party reporting is really important, they will look at me like I'm an idiot. That's what they've been doing uh, at least since, uh, in, in the UK, at least since the late uh, 1690s. The land tax was the first. Well, actually, it wasn't the first. I've since discovered the first withholding in the UK was 1245. So tax administrators don't really learn much from this. It may be a very nice, very well-documented study, but it's not actually terribly helpful. On the lotteries <coughs> you can, and, the, and the nudges, there is a question, well, you may be able to show uh, some, uh, some potentially some revenue gain from these things, but is this really first order importance? When you go to a, when we think about the revenue mobilization challenges we think about for achieving the sustainable development goals, do we really think lotteries or nudges are going to give us enough money, frankly? And the answer, I suspect, is actually not. The, the actual numbers that come out of these studies are really quite small. These are not the things that administrators really need to get to grips with you know, if they're really to achieve these revenue mobilization objectives. So nice research papers, very nicely done, but in terms of helping uh, achieve uh, something real in developing countries and elsewhere, we still have a lot to go. So that's why I think there's still quite a way to go in terms of trying to make theory more useful um, <clears throat> by providing some practical frameworks in which we can think about administration and also integrate our think about administration with some ideas on, on policy. So what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is to try and talk through some of those, uh, some of those ideas and really take as my starting point something, the idea that I mentioned a moment ago, the idea of, uh, of a tax gap. Tax gap what I'm going to explain in more detail what I mean, but this is the idea that there is a gap between what the tax law says the government should be collecting and what it is collecting. And more precisely, I'm going to call that the compliance gap. So tax administrators actually care quite a lot about the compliance gap, uh, and they've actually started measuring it quite, uh, quite carefully in recent years, and I'll say a bit more about that too. So I want to take this idea of a, of a compliance gap and think about, well, what, what is the significance of the, of the tax gap when we think about uh, wider tax system reform, administrative reform, policy reform? How do we as economists make sense of this idea that seems to have some appeal to uh, administration people? And then I'm going to take up from there the question of, well, <clears throat> what is the optimal tax gap? Probably the optimal tax gap is not zero. It's probably not optimal to go to a world in which everybody always complies with their tax obligations 100%, because that's probably going to require uh, quite heavy uh, administrative costs, compliance costs. It may actually have some adverse effects on behavior, distort, uh, add to the distortions in the tax system, and so on. So the optimal compliance gap is probably not zero. So well, what is it? How do we think about what an optimal compliance gap is? When you think about that question, that takes you into a wider question, which is one I'm going to focus on, which is, well, how do you think about optimal tax administration more generally? How do you think about what an optimal administrative intervention is? And as a corollary of that, how do you go about assessing administrative interventions? What are the kind of things you need to know in order to decide whether some particular administrative reform is good or bad? So those are the kind of issues I want to, uh, to focus on. So I'm going to say first a little bit about uh, <clears throat> flesh out a little bit more this idea of a tax gap and why it might matter and how these it's a, it's a way in which we can think about uh, integrating policy and administration in ways that can be quite useful for first order importance uh, problems of revenue mobilization. So <clears throat> I'm going to think about this by in the context of thinking about the VAT. So <clears throat> of course for, for many countries, uh, not least developing countries, the VAT is an important source of revenue making the VAT work properly 
is going to be a key to achieving any kind of revenue mobilization goal. So let's think about VAT performance. Naturally, people like us, the fund, we get very interested in what happens to VAT revenue. So let's think about how we can understand developments in VAT revenue. So here I'm simply writing VAT revenue, V as a percent of GDP, Y. So the left is VAT revenue percent of GDP. And then simply by multiplying and dividing various stuff, you can write the VAT to VAT revenue ratio in this as a product of three things. One is uh, tau S, which is just the standard rate, the, the most common rate of the value added tax. Skipping to the end, C over Y is just aggregate consumption in GDP. And then the thing in the middle, this EC, is a concept called C efficiency, which is going to be important in, in, uh, in what I discuss. This is a common measure that people use to think about really how effective a value added tax is. And what it is, as you'll see in the definition there, C efficiency is basically revenue from the VAT divided by <coughs> the revenue you would get if you applied the standard rate of VAT to all consumption. So, for example, if you had a VAT that taxed all consumption at the same rate, doesn't matter what the rate is, and there was no uh, avoidance or evasion, then C efficiency would be one. So it's a, you can see it's going to be a kind of measure of departures from a uniform uh, VAT on a broad base. I know for this audience there are going to be issues about desirability of a VAT at a uniform rate uh, on a broad base, but maybe for this analytical purpose we can put that aside. I'm quite happy to, to discuss that in itself. So once you've done that, you can then think about, well, okay, so what, how do we explain what happened in VAT revenue? So here, for the first, for the, uh, some years ago now, this basically, the dots show what happened to uh, changes in VAT revenue by income group over this particular period. So what was driving that? Well, your first guess might be, well, maybe they've been playing around with the standard rate. Well, actually, no, the standard rate doesn't explain much of what's actually happened to VAT revenue, perhaps surprisingly. What about changes in consumption relative to GDP? Well, no, that doesn't really help much either. In fact, it tends to go the other way in a number of countries. So what really explains it is the thing in yellow, except in high-income countries, particularly in the, in the non-high-income countries, is changes in sea efficiency. So if you want to understand what's happening to VAT revenue, sea efficiency is the thing you really need to understand. Standard rate's not a big story. The real story is all to do with sea efficiency. So what drives sea efficiency? Well, you can do another kind of decomposition and write C efficiency as, uh, again, this is just multiplying and dividing by various things to get, to get it to look uh, uh, nice. So what you end up with is C efficiency, if you look to the right of the equation, is the product of this 1 minus P and 1 minus, uh, what's that, gamma, right, capital gamma. So gamma is, is the compliance gap. So gamma, for example, is the difference between uh, the revenue you should be collecting if the tax system, whatever it is, uniform rate or not, whatever it is, that's the revenue difference between the revenue you should get if the thing was properly enforced. Uh, rev ratio of that to the revenue, sorry, sorry, the other way around. So ratio of the revenue actually got to um, the uh, revenue you'd collect if the thing were properly enforced. So that's gamma, it's a compliance gap. The other term P, uh, I'm gonna call a policy gap, subject to the qualification I mentioned a moment ago. This is basically the difference between the revenue you've got and the revenue you would get if you had a uniform rate uh, on all consumption. So P is really picking up the effects of rate differentiation, exemptions, and so on. Gamma is picking up the effects of non-compliance. So what's quite neat about that? Well, before I spell out that more, just to remind you then the compliance gap is this excess of, uh, of um, uh, essentially uh, basically telling you how much you're not collecting that you should be collecting. And as I mentioned, this is something that tax administrators have got really interested in measuring recently. Uh, UK has been doing this for several years. It's now done regularly for the European Union. Uh, one of the things that we do at the fund is we have this thing called the RA Gap Project, which basically goes to uh, helps developing countries in particular to measure the VAT gap. We're doing work on the corporate taxes as well, but basically uh, getting uh, numbers for what's going on with the compliance gap. And as, as, uh, <coughs> as, we, as uh, the previous slide implies, really what you want is a measure of the compliance gap and combine it with a measure of the policy gap. One of the neat things, by the way, of course, is that if you know C efficiency, C efficiency is usually easy to get. So if you get one of the other two, for example, if you know the compliance gap, then you can figure out what the policy gap is. So you don't need to measure all three. You can uh, infer one from any two of them. 
So for example, I mentioned this is the kind of thing we've been doing in a number of countries. Uh, don't need to go through the details, but on the right, uh, Uganda, the blue line is an estimated com compliance gap. The red line is an estimated policy gap. Uh, South Africa, um, ignore the red line. Uh, the line at the top is the policy gap, and the line at the bottom is the compliance gap. So why is this interesting? This is really telling you that if you're looking at Uganda, the real issue is compliance. The policy gap's actually not that bad. The real issue is compliance. In South Africa, on the other hand, it's the other way around. That in South Africa, the real issue is the policy gap. It's not so much the compliance gap in terms of thinking about uh, the overall effectiveness of the VAT. So this kind of analysis, uh, I think, bringing together a bit of economics with a bit of administration helps you identify what are the priorities for reform. So Uganda, you can quantify all these things, of course. You can say, well, actually, in Uganda, if you were, say, to uh, halve the compliance gap, that would get you three points of GDP, which is a big number. So this is kind of, you know, when you're thinking about uh, making real first-order effects on, on, um, uh, on, on revenue mobilization, that's, uh, that's a big number. And you can f go further in this kind of analysis to try and figure out where the compliance gaps are arising. So the methodology of this, of this gap analysis, which I won't go into now, does let you identify particular sectors in which the compliance gap uh, arises. So on the, in, on the left, uh, basically the numbers correspond to different sectors, and you can see uh, where the biggest gaps between potential uh, and actual collection are by sector, and that then informs, uh, potentially informs your administrative intervention. So what I like about this, of course, and well, just to give another example, if you think about the, the UK, which as I mentioned has been doing this for a while, you track what's happened to the compliance gap over time, and you can think about, well, how do we explain it? Well, a couple of things come to mind. We know 2005 was a big uh, period for carousel fraud, and we know uh, that uh, the, the crisis years, compliance always uh, worsens uh, in economic crisis, uh, after economic crisis. So again, this is the kind of things you can try and figure out what's really going on with compliance. Clearly, there's a bunch of modeling potentially to be done on uh, compliance behavior, even at an aggregate level. Um, <clears throat> so what I like about this is a kind of framework which brings together some economics and some administration in thinking about uh, uh, essentially the balance between an appropriate design of administrative and policy interventions, figuring out where the kind of bang for the buck is, all in a kind of coherent framework that lets you think both about policy and administration. But of course, there are some problems with, with this. And the one question that comes to mind, uh, which is a question that I always irritate my tax administration colleagues with, because pretty much whatever they figure out the compliance gap is, they tend to think it's too big. Um, and that's a kind of a natural thing to do. But as I mentioned, closing the compliance gap is not costly. There are going to be resources. There are going to be distortions involved. So. What actually is the optimal compliance gap? How do we know whether the compliance gap uh, is too large or too small? More generally, as I was mentioning before, how do, we, how do we go about characterizing optimal administrative interventions? And that brings me kind of to the second uh, main part of what I want to talk about, which is this idea of trying to get towards some notion of optimal tax administration. And more precisely, uh, sort of there, are, there are kind of three questions that come to mind that one might want to ask. So one is, well, how should we assess administrative interventions? So as I said, if someone is, I don't know, if, if you're having a kind of functional reorganization of the tax administration, if you're thinking of opening up medium, some medium taxpayer offices, if you're thinking of um, changing the uh, remuneration policy for tax administrators, uh, how would you actually go about assessing whether that policy potentially is or in practice was a good thing or not. And you think about, um, and as I said, that we don't really have a framework for this, whereas we do have a very well-defined general framework for thinking, about <clears throat> for thinking about optimal policy, particularly thinking about optimal tax rates. Many of you will know, for example, well in particular, of the concept of the elasticity of taxable income. So the elasticity of taxable income is basically the responsiveness of the tax base to uh, the tax rate that may reflect both behavioral changes and avoidance evasion decisions. And there's this uh, <clears throat> pretty seminal result going back to Feldstein that says really that's a sufficient statistic for thinking about the welfare impact of change in the tax rate. The clever thing is you don't need to know what the responsiveness in, is in terms of uh, work effort 
relative or compared to the responsiveness in terms of evasion or avoidance. All you need to know is this summary statistic of how change in the tax rate affects taxable income. And the, the higher that tax rate is, uh, the lower the optimal tax rate tends to be because that, uh, that means more uh, distortion behavioral responses at the margin. So on policy, we have a very well-defined sufficient statistic for thinking about uh, tax rate interventions, the elasticity of taxable income. Well, <clears throat> what about administration? If we think of also administration as something governments can vary, just as they vary tax rates, is there also a sufficient statistic on that side of things? Is there some st single number that we should be thinking about when we do uh, evaluation work on administrative reforms, some sufficient statistic for making normative judgments and evaluating policy? So that's one question. The second question is the one I've already mentioned, which is kind of a corollary of the first one. So <clears throat> once we have a theory of what optimal administrative interventions are, can we then figure out, well, what, uh, how do we characterize an optimal compliance gap in that setting? So that's a kind of a special case of the more general question of assessing administrative intervention. So how can we know when a compliance gap is too big uh, or too small? And the third is kind of, um, <clears throat> Kind of an amazingly basic question. Suppose you're a, you're a government, you need to raise some revenue, you need to raise a whole bunch of revenue to meet uh, the SDGs or whatever. Well, you basically have two ways you can go about it. You can think about raising tax rates uh, or doing or, in, or, or policy measures more broadly, and or you can think about uh, strengthening enforcement or more generally by undertaking administrative reform. So this is a very basic choice that really all policymakers face. Yet, <clears throat> and the question is, well, which should it be? What is the better route to go? Is it better to, uh, to put your resource into uh, uh, closing compliance gaps or, into, uh, or to, to raise additional resources by playing around on the policy side? Very basic question, yet we don't have any, as far as I know, no one has ever given a particularly satisfactory answer to that question or even a, a framework within which you can think about it. Uh, so that's another kind of challenge in all this, is to think about, well, how do we know which is better? Which is better to raise revenue? Is it administration or policy measures? So those are three questions. Let me kind of set up a, a, a little setting, a framework to kind of um, uh, address them. Um, so this is based on some work with Joel Slamwood. So I'll, I'm not going to go through the algebra in any detail. Um, for those of you who like algebra, this will all be very obvious. For those of you who don't like algebra, me trying to explain it won't actually help. Um, but basically, so here's a kind of very standard framework. Let's just think about the representative individual. We can talk about extensions later. So what does this individual do? Well, they earn some income. They have a wage rate W. They supply some labor L. They pay some tax rate at, uh, with big T. Tax depends on their wage income minus some amount E that uh, they conceal from the tax authorities. So it could be evasion, could be avoidance. For the moment, I don't really care. So tax is kind of your is on your declared income. On the other hand, <clears throat> there are some costs, C, of uh, either complying or not complying with the tax system. <coughs> Excuse me. Those costs depend on how much you avoid or conceal, E, but also on this alpha thing. This alpha thing is going to be important. That's some administrative intervention. So this is some administrative intervention that works by making compliance more or less uh, costly. Uh, and then there's also, at the end, V of R, <coughs> some valuation attached to the public expenditure uh, that the revenue finances. So the revenue, little r, is simply the tax revenue less <coughs> some administration costs, big A of alpha, so those are the administration costs, what it actually costs to the tax authorities. C, on the other hand, is more like compliance costs, cost incurred by the taxpayer. So what's going on is the taxpayer chooses labor and how much to avoid or evade, they choose L and E. The government chooses the tax rate T and its administrative intervention alpha. So this is a very, this is, for those of you who know it, this is basically the same as kind of Chetty Sias framework, but with uh, an administrative intervention thrown in on top. <clears throat> so not surprisingly, um, when you think about the choice of T, there's nothing new here. This gives you the, the standard result, standard and familiar result, that the elasticity of taxable income is a sufficient statistic for thinking about uh, uh, the optimal tax rate. So the higher that elasticity, the lower is the optimal tax rate. And <clears throat> as many of you all know, we now have a huge empirical literature 
that tries to estimate this uh, elasticity of taxable income in various circumstances. Well, <clears throat> so nothing new then. Um, but the framework does help us to answer those three questions that I mentioned. Firstly, when you think about administrative intervention, you get a very simple rule for the choice of alpha, <clears throat> which is this. <clears throat> There's this thing on the left called phi, which is, think of it for the moment, as a ratio of administration and compliance cost to revenue. The interesting thing there is that's pretty much what this boring literature I started off at the, at the outset uh, has focused on, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So on the left, we have cost terms. Boring stuff, <coughs> uh, but there's been a lot of work estimating them. More interesting is this E thing. <coughs> so E, <coughs> big E means an elasticity. So this is the elasticity of Z with respect to alpha. What is Z? Z is taxable income. So it's the WL minus E. It's the kind of income the tax authorities get to see. So this is just the elasticity of taxable uh, income with respect to the enforcement parameter. So what's going on here? Why is this at all interesting? Because now this elasticity, which more generally is an enforcement elasticity of tax revenue, is a sufficient statistic for thinking about administrative interventions. So all you need to know on the administration side, an exact parallel, and in some respects actually more general than the elasticity of taxable income on the policy side, is this elasticity of tax revenue. It's a base of responsiveness of tax revenue with respect to your administrative intervention. So that's the answer to the first question. There is a sufficient statistic and it's this enforcement elasticity of, uh, of revenue. And so I won't go through it here, time doesn't allow, but you can think of, you know, if you, if you give me numbers for the valuation of public goods, you give me numbers for administration costs and compliance costs, I wave my hands a little bit, but then I can basically tell you whether more or less enforcement is a good idea. So basically this gives you a simple rule of thumb for figuring out uh, whether an intervention is good or bad, whether you should do more of it or less of it. There is, no one's really, as I said, there's a huge list on the elasticity of taxable income, not really anything directly on this enforcement elasticity, but you can uh, back out some estimates, <coughs> kind of more or less by, by, uh, by serendipity, by chance, from some things that are out there. I won't go through it, but um, <coughs> so the compliance gap measures I mentioned, you can back something out. The, the closest is there has actually been some work done at the IRS in the US from which you can infer pretty careful estimates that turn out to be uh, of this enforcement elasticity. But I won't go through these numbers here. The point is that this is clearly a kind of, you know, we have an industry on the policy side. We're really stuck for numbers on the administration side. Just to say a bit more on that cost term, uh, this fee, the one that was on the left <coughs> here, this fee term here. So as I mentioned, that's more or less a ratio of compliance costs plus administration costs to revenue, which is what that older literature focused on, with a couple of wrinkles that I won't go into. One is, as is well known, you have to wait, for social evaluation purposes, you have to wait administration and compliance costs slightly differently. <coughs> compliance costs are a little bit cheaper because they're essentially paid directly by the taxpayer as a lump sum, not in the form of a distorting taxes. And of course, not surprisingly, uh, much of the literature has focused on averages of these administration and compliance costs. What you need for this is marginal costs. But nonetheless, we can think of getting some numbers for that. So just to give an example, there are there's, um, <clears throat> people, this is not hard to apply, and people are beginning to apply it. There's a, a paper by uh, Meiselman, who essentially applies this framework to a kind of a fairly standard thing of sending letters to potential uh, or suspected non-filers in the city of Detroit. And basically, you can go through this is the kind of a, this is just a discrete analog to, to the framework I was just describing. So you can see, for example, it depends on this valuation of public goods, this delta Z, the change in the taxable income, which is where this enforcement elasticity term changes in administration costs and compliance costs. So he goes through the exercise of actually putting numbers on all these things, <clears throat> and actually turns out that you know this is a kind of fairly standard experiment. It turns out, of course, the letter does lead to more compliance, but is it a good policy? <clears throat> does it make sense as a, as a policy? Well, it turns out the answer is no. When you do this properly, uh, I guess we often tend to think of these nitrous as generally being useful. This one clearly is not, is not worth it. And importantly, just as a kind of an aside, the reason it doesn't work is because of the compliance costs. And these kind of, which turn out to be quite large. Um, people spend, you induce people to fill in reforms, fill in forms that take them a lot of money, that take them a lot of time, but don't actually give you much money. 
Um, the aside there is, is simply to note the compliance costs matter a lot in all this. People often do these kind of exercises and maybe say a little bit about administrative costs, don't think at all about compliance costs. But compliance costs can well be the dominant consideration in lots of these exercises. And again, I think when we think about areas where we need to do more, it's clear that we tend to ignore compliance costs uh, much too much. Question two, and I'll be fairly, uh, fairly brief. You won't be surprised that you can, you can basically rearrange that optimality condition to get an expression for the optimal compliance gap. Uh, it depends on a slightly different elasticity, which is not surprising because the compliance gap is not a welfare measure. So that elasticity is not sufficient because compliance gap itself is not a welfare indicator. Um, but you get a very simple rule that lets you figure out uh, whether the compliance gap is too big or too small or not. So again, at the bottom, I just give you some illustrative numbers. If you tell me, uh, you know, if you tell me the compliant, what the compliance gap is, then I can figure out what that elasticity has to be in order for it to be worth uh, uh, undertaking a reduction of that, uh, uh, of that compliance gap. <clears throat> third, third question was this one about administration versus policy. Uh, and something that drops out very neatly from this framework is really just a very simple condition that tells you whether you want to raise an additional dollar through by raising the tax rate or by administration. It's not terribly surprising what turns out to matter. These two elasticities tend to matter, uh, as well as uh, compliance and administration costs. There are some wrinkles, but it's not terribly surprising. <clears throat> but what's important, I think, is the thing I'm not showing you, which is really just an explicit expression that lets you just put numbers in and figure out, well, this is what we should do. This is, we should go administration or we should go policy. Once you think about things in this way, um, <clears throat> Once you think about administration and policy integrated in this way, it, it does actually also raise a number of other questions, which I think people haven't actually thought about much. Take another question. <clears throat> so I've been going on about administration integrating with policy. Well, <clears throat> are administration and policy, or more precisely, administrative interventions and tax rates, are they strategic substitutes or are they strategic complements? That is, if for some reason uh, your administrative, the level of your administrative spending is fixed too low, does that mean you're going to set higher tax rates or lower tax rates than you otherwise would? Intuitively, it's not completely obvious. Uh, and it turns out that that matters quite a lot. Just to give you an example of why it matters, suppose we think about technology. And suppose we think that really what one of the effects of technology is that evasion is going to be make, uh, evasion is going to become harder. It's going to be easier for tax authorities to detect evasion. It's not clear that's true, but let's suppose that's the story. Well, you can, uh, you can then ask, well, actually, okay, so evasion is harder. Does that mean we think tax rates are gonna be lower because it's easier for, now for us to raise revenue, or do we think tax rates are gonna be higher because now there are less distorting effects from, from the tax system? Well, that turns out to depend on whether these things are strategic complements or strategic substitutes. I won't go through the diagram on the left, but basically this is just drawing, you know, on the bottom is alpha, on the left is T, so the T alpha shows what is the optimal tax rate conditional on, on a, level of, uh, a particular level of administrative intervention, similar alpha T. Play around with these curves and you can see basically uh, <coughs> if, if technology makes detecting evasion easier, that means the alpha T curve is going to, or the T alpha show curve shifts to the, uh, to, to the right and you can see that in this case uh, the tax rate is going to, the optimal tax rate is going to fall but not too hard to believe that if these curves were differently shaped, it would go the other way. Tax rates would, uh, would go up as a consequence of digitalization. So this is just a, an example of a kind of a fairly, I, I don't know, I've never seen anyone even think about that question. Are these things complements or substitutes? And it matters actually quite a lot for things uh, that we're gonna be facing in the future. There's a whole load of possible extensions. I won't go through, it turns out to be a fairly robust framework. Easy to have many administrative instruments. Um, to think about multiple households, all these kind of things straightforward to do. Gets a little bit more complicated uh, when you allow for um, slightly more general forms of concealment costs, compliance costs, but basically uh, you can extend this all fairly straightforwardly. So with that, then let me, let me, just, uh, let me just conclude. Uh, so I hope having sort of uh, persuaded you that, uh, or tried to persuade you that there is still a lot more scope for addressing first order policy issues by better integrating theory, evidence, and uh, consideration of practicalities. Um, <clears throat> some of you will have seen this juxtaposition of quotes that I've, I've used before, I confess. 
Uh, <coughs> so several years ago, uh, Slemmer of Yudzaki said, well, basically, the, the theory on tax administration is pretty well developed. So it's time to put the rest to, to, to rest the claim that all this stuff is understudied. Uh, on the other hand, there's uh, John Hazeldine, who's a tax administration guy, who basically says that the literature on tax administration is terrible. Um, I confess my inclination has been rather more with the, the, the second quote than with the first, <coughs> but I think things are, are getting better. With that, I take one minute to try and, so this is just to mention, uh, when we think about research, a couple of uh, data things that we're involved in at the fund that I hope will soon provide sources of, uh, of useful data and think about tax administration. So one is, a, is something called the International Survey of Revenue Administrations, which we do now jointly with the OECD, IOTA, SEAT, um, which is basically trying to collect comparative or comparable uh, administration data from countries around the world at all levels of, of development. Uh, so for example, things like on-time filing rates, all these kind of uh, magnitudes that tax administrators look to when they assess their performance. So those data should be uh, becoming available. And there's also something called the Tax Administration Diagnostic Tool, um, which we're actually pretty excited with at the fund, which is, a, which is called TADAP, which it basically helps, uh, we've done I think now for 30 or 30 countries or so, helps countries assess in a very detailed way aspects of their uh, tax revenues administration's performance. You get scores from A to D. Uh, some of these are public, but uh, we hope to make the data available more generally. So, for example, <coughs> Zambia, this is the kind of breakdown of scores you get. <coughs> this is across all dimensions of the tax administration's performance, from registration all the way through to appeals and, and governance and so on. Um, and just on the right, there's a kind of little chart that indicates the sort of variation in, in results that we get across countries. So I'm hoping that we're hoping that those two will, will start to um, uh, become regular uh, input into thinking about tax administration issues, how it maybe relates to other aspects of policy, um, but I think with that, noting there's some references at the end, with that I will conclude and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I hope you will join me in uh, thanking Mick. I mean, and as researchers, of course, uh, what Mick has done is being stressing what we do not know, and of course that's extremely welcome. Both as an opening to this conference, but also uh, in general for us to try to get our focus right and start addressing the things we do not know. So thank you very much, Mick. Yeah.